one solution to the famous flying saucer mystery may have been discovered by American police in Maryland, who came across this weird-looking aircraft while searching for inventor Jonathan Colwell, who recently disappeared. It certainly could fill the bill, but whether it's the original flying saucer, no one yet knows. Dr. Herman Oberth, who pioneered rocket design during World War II, once cryptically stated, quote, We cannot take the credit for our record advancement in certain scientific fields. We have been helped. When asked by whom, he replied, The people of other worlds. Additionally, according to Above Top Secret by Timothy Good and William Morrow, Oberth's fellow space pioneer, Werner von Braun, echoed this mysterious reference even including the existence of extraterrestrials, when he stated in 1959, quote, We find ourselves faced by powers which are far stronger than hitherto assumed, and whose base is at present unknown to us. More I cannot say at present. We are now engaged in entering into closer contact with those powers, and within six or nine months' time, it may be possible to speak with more precision on the matter. End quote. Just who were the people of other worlds that Dr. Oberth spoke of? Or indeed, these entities that von Braun referred to? With only Oberth's quotations, one could presume a possible reverse engineering of alien craft. However, with von Braun's more detailed expose, this possibility seems to be excluded in favor of pertained actual assistance and contact with advanced beings. Many people also believe that an encounter with these beings, along with Third Reich craft built with their technology, was once encountered in an operation known as Operation High Jump. According to certain independent researchers, Richard E. Byrd, admiral of this operation, possibly encountered a hostile, formidable opponent, who he has claimed to have described as fighters that were able to fly from one pole to another with incredible speed. In reality, however, whatever Byrd's expedition experienced may never be fully publicly disclosed, as all reports, including Byrd's personal log entries, remain mysteriously classified. But the connections between these curious quotations, and indeed the rumored encounters by this classified operation, are certainly intriguing. Furthermore, Operation High Jump was originally organized by Secretary of the Navy James Forrestal. Interestingly, in 1949, Forrestal was sent to recover from a supposed nervous breakdown at Bethesda Naval Hospital. However, after allegedly ranting to staff about the Antarctic, UFOs, and an underground Nazi city, Forrestal was denied all visitors shortly after a fall from his hospital room window. What did Forrestal know? Were his perceived delusional rants based upon reality? According to the legend of the German Vril Society, a secret remote viewing was held in 1919 at an old hunting lodge near Brechtsgaden. During this event, Maria Arsic, a self-proclaimed medium, presented her supposed telepathic messages, which she claimed to have received from an extraterrestrial civilization existing in the constellation of Taurus. It is reported that these messages contained instructions for building a circular flight machine. It is interesting to note that German Oriental scholars and occultists alike regarded such mystic teachings with complete seriousness, with well-documented, well-funded, diligent efforts put forth to discover and such individually proclaimed powers and their messages therein into viable technological realities. What happened in the Antarctic? Who were these people from other worlds that von Braun and Oberth spoke of? Did the Third Reich make contact with an alien or possible highly advanced once ancient civilization, allowing them to engineer mystifying technologies? We find such claims, rumors, and fragments of evidence to support such possible realities highly compelling. More than two years ago, a team of explorers led by scientist Vladimir Melikov were on an expedition within the Russian caves on Mount Bolshoi when they made a miraculous discovery. 
Reports from Russian newspapers at the time indicated that a briefcase and two alien-like skulls were discovered in the cave systems of the Caucasus region. What is amazing about the briefcase is the insignia which can be found upon its front. It is the emblem of the Anenerbi, once the Nazis' most secretive institutions. Founded by Heinrich Himmler in 1935, their mission was to find evidence that the Aryan race had once ruled the entire world. But they also branched into occultism, paranormal research, pseudoscience, and the study of UFOs and weapons development. All due to Himmler's obsession with such things. The strange appearance of the skulls has led to speculation that the Nazis were in contact with aliens. Mr. Melikov was reported as saying the creature is unlike anything known to man. He said among the most mysterious features of the skulls is the absence of a cranial vault or jaws. The eye sockets are also unusually large. He added, even when compared with the skull of a bear, it is hard to think that you do not have in your hands the remains of an alien creature. Paleontologists in Moscow were shown pictures of the skulls. They reportedly dismissed the skulls, saying they could have been exposed to sand for long periods of time, which could have altered their shape. Russian newspaper reports have also recorded other German discoveries in the area, including last summer when Elbrus Hunters found a second suitcase with the Anenerby logo. It is thought to have belonged to the huntsman of the German division Edelweiss, and was found along with a ring showing a soldier in a mountain cap and a Nazi uniform. The Edelweiss was an emblem of the German mountain troops during World War II. Also in 2014, reports said locals in the same area found the burial site of German infantry, believed to have been killed in an avalanche years earlier. What do you think about the finds? Are these skulls proof that the Nazis knew of the existence of aliens? Or maybe that they were even in contact with such entities? The skulls and briefcase are now said to be stored at an archaeological complex in Belovode, a site which stores many historical artifacts. Further studies are desperately needed before they vanish from public view. The Lady of Elche, a limestone bus that was first discovered in 1897. It was found at an archaeological site on a private estate, two kilometers south of Elche within Spain, currently exhibited at the National Archaeological Museum in Madrid. The artistic influences involved in creating her are a heavily debated topic, this undoubtedly due to her unusual appearance and the fact that no one seems to be able to pinpoint her origins. According to the Encyclopedia of Religion, the Lady of Elche is believed to have a direct association with Tanit, the goddess of Carthage, who was once worshipped by the Punic Iberians. Though at best, this could be perceived as a guess, based on vague similarity. Clearly, the most striking and intriguing detail surrounding the Lady of Elche is her mysterious and possibly advanced technological appendages. Positioned around her head and flowing down the bust, the original function for these strange decorations is unknown. The current academically accepted view is that the originally polychromed bust is thought to have represented a woman wearing a complex headdress with large wheel-like coils known similar to rodettes on each side of the face. This of course is regardless of the fact that they look nothing like modern or indeed other ancient examples of rodettes or decorative wares from any publicly known ancient culture. While some scholars suggest that the sculpture is Iberian and associated with Tanit, the goddess of Carthage, others have proposed the work reflects a long-lost Atlantean goddess. The unusual features of the sculpture, such as the quietly kept detail that she had an elongated head, along with the curious yet clearly complex spools on her head, has led many independent researchers to suspect the spools were not part of a unique headdress, but was a type of lost technology, reflecting the highly advanced nature of the lost and forgotten Atlantean civilization. Art historian John F. Moffat, along with most of academia, agree that the shape of the lady's eyes, nose, and other features were too delicate to have been carved in pre-Christian Spain. Therefore, predictably, Instead of suspecting that an unknown, highly advanced civilization could have possibly created it, 
many academics have simply concluded it to be an elaborate hoax, regardless of the compelling evidence upon the statue which displays its true antiquity. And also of the fact that in 1997, the mayor of Elche fought to have the bust of the Lady of Elche returned from the National Archaeological Museum of Spain in Madrid to the city of Elche, to be on display during celebrations of the city's 2000th year. It was to be a special exhibit, but the petition to have the bust returned was denied. The government commission that denied the request asserted that the bust was too fragile to survive the 250-mile journey from Madrid to Elche. However, others believe that this denial was based on political motivations. The director of Elche's archaeological museum, Rafael Ramos, argued that it was preposterous to say that the statue could not survive the journey, noting that more delicate pieces are transported around the world regularly. Do these sound like the actions of a group of people who suspect the artifact to be a fake? Or does it sound more like the actions of a group of conspiring individuals with an aim of retaining a valuable, yet largely unknown relic? Is the statue of the Lady of Elche a long-lost Atlantean bust? Or maybe a leader of a group of beings whom once visited Earth? Questions surrounding the Lady of Elche largely remain unanswered. How did she end up in a farmer's field in Spain? The disputes and specialist theories surrounding the Lady of Elche clearly illustrate the secret importance of the bust. Just who was the Lady of Elche? An ancient queen? Perhaps an ancient alien? When a piece is clearly treasured by the same group who contest it as a fake, we always find such objects highly compelling. We previously covered what is undoubtedly one of the most peculiar ancient statues ever unearthed. Now known as the Lady of Elche, she mysteriously turned up in 1897 on a private estate two kilometers south of Elche, Spain. Her unusual headdress is obviously her most baffling characteristic and a subject of heated debate to this day. Some claim that it is nothing but a mere fashion item although their links to other ancient examples are reaching at best. Other theories pertain to them depicting some form of ancient advanced headphones, an antenna, or even that she was actually an ancient alien. An additional enigma surrounding the Lady of Elche is the cavity within her back, empty when discovered. The question is, why was the statue made in such a way? What was once placed within the statue? The information known about her is, understandably, extremely limited. She was long thought to be one of a kind, and as such, easily dismissed by academics as a mere one-off. However, it seems the lady wasn't actually unique. Additionally, she may have actually been a rather well-known figure to a civilization we are possibly yet to understand. Although the statue was found in Spain in 1969, in Richfield, Utah, another as yet unexplained object was found. Discovered at a depth of 6 feet, within soil that contained no other evidence of past disturbance, what some now think was once a buckle adorned with what clearly was an image of the Lady of Elche. The question is, who was the Lady of Elche? Why is an ancient medallion, presumed belt buckle, found within an empty field in Utah adorned with her image. Furthermore, upon the observance of the buckle, along with the bust of the Lady of Elche, is perhaps the most compelling clue pertaining to her identity discovered yet. Many people suggested that, due to the Lady of Elche's unusual existence and the claimed location of the discovery of the buckle, it was claimed that the Utah Lady was in fact a fake. However, after extensive research, the inscription upon the obverse was found to actually be authentic ancient Assyrian, translated as the Assyrian. Was this the original name for the Lady of Elche? Who were these particular-looking Assyrians? Was she a member of the civilization modern academia have permitted such extensive study of? If so, why are we not aware of such a clearly famous yet visually unique character? 
Were the Assyrians actually another lost, advanced, ancient civilization? Perhaps the inspiration for the name of the Assyrian culture we are so aware of? Are the real Assyrians being obscured by a claimed more recent imposter by academia? Or were they merely a weird fashion item? For now, her identity is still up for debate. However, such finds undoubtedly strengthen some highly compelling possibilities.